call this meeting to order. Make sure all the roll, please. Here. Nice work. Here.
over on West 7, basically here because of the, the masking tonight. I know you guys probably already have decided, but you guys focus on the, the case numbers. You're not focused enough on what this is actually doing to our younger group, the comprehension. Like for my family, for example, if we weren't fortunate enough to have an extra occupational therapy, God only knows how far behind he is. You know, this community is like what, average sub 50K a person? It's hard to afford extra stuff like that. So this is very impactful. And I could argue that they're closer at, at recess or lunchtime rather than the classroom. You know, this is just, it hurts. Not me, my kids. So. Thank you. Thank you, everybody else. Yeah, we, it is 641 of the public hearing. 
for the Bloom ECC project. And basically, this is uh, just a last opportunity for any public comments or anything otherwise. Thank you. 
of the hot ones, they could have time to have vex the first vaccine clinic get through. That was the original thought. The first vaccine is through right now, first vaccine clinic? I'm saying by ending at the end of the day on the 22nd, by the time students would return, then they would have had the opportunity to have both the first and second shot with uh, two weeks. That was the thought process behind that. Um, so Dr. Dane is here and Diana Burial 
who uh, works in our elementary schools, and I wrote a grant in 2018, um, and we were awarded that grant. And so we've been working on integrating computer science in ever since. Uh, one of my favorite projects is one that I have up And this is what I do with third graders, the uh, green screen project. Uh, and at the beginning of their third grade year, they pick a book that they like that they want to recommend to their peers. Um, and so they create a word cloud, which is the background up there. And then uh, they take their picture of themselves in front of the green screen, and then we use an app to put it together. And so for computer science standards, we talk about the impact of technology and how sometimes you see pictures, you see videos, et cetera, that really aren't um, exactly how they look. And so that um, hits those computer science standards. And then as the librarian, I love it because we have kids recommending the books that they like. Uh, we hang these up all over the library, so especially our second graders who are coming into a new, much bigger library than they're used to at Page and Lincoln um, can see kind of what the big kids are recommending, and it's, it's a fun project. Last week was Computer Science Education Week, um, and so a lot of different things were happening at Franklin, but in the library, uh, we did computer science projects with second, third, and fourth grade. Um, our second graders on the left, we're starting their green screen project. They do an iSpy page that they put themselves in, and again, we start learning about that green screen technology and the impacts that technology has on our society. Um, in the middle, we have a third grader creating a binary code bracelet. So we talk about binary coding and how to create the alphabet using binary coding, and then they make a bracelet with their first initial. So that's what he's doing. And then our fourth graders on the right um, do some coding where they pretend that their classmates are robots and they write a code, a code, excuse me, for them to stack cups in a certain way. And then their classmate acts as the robot and has to follow the code. And so they have to see if their code needs debugged or if it works out um, and what they can do to change that. So that was last week at Franklin. Um, another one of the things that I've worked on in our libraries is to move to a genre-based organization for our fiction sections. This is something fairly new in the library world. Um, and so we started at Franklin, and I've done Franklin in the middle school so far, and I'm in progress at the high school. But it's instead of just having one big fiction section, we have a section for realistic fiction and mysteries and fantasy and horror and so on. Um, and it's been pretty popular. They kind of call it the bookstore model because normally when you walk into a bookstore, you kind of see those divisions and kids are able to be a little bit more independent in the library um, and find kind of read-alikes when they get done with a series they have enjoyed or anything like that. Um, another uh, one of the initiatives we've done, and um, this is done at Franklin and the middle school, is called March Book Madness. Um, I stole this idea, to be completely honest, uh, from online, but I have kind of changed it. There is a group that puts out a list uh, for different ages online, but I decided to kind of personalize it for our school. And so what I do is I take the top 16 circulated books that year and put them into a bracket. So there's our sweet 16. And then the kids, um, once I post that up on the wall, they make their prediction brackets and they figure out who they th which books they think are going to be the most popular, and then we go week by week and they vote um, until we get to the end. We pulled in some community partners with this. Um, Dairy Queen has donated like ice cream cone coupons, and Taco John's has donated like potato Olay coupons, and so we've had some uh, different things with that. And I know when I spoke to Rotary, they said they might be interested in getting us some book prizes, so it's kind of exciting too. Um, secondary uh, is a little bit different than elementary, of course, just as our students get older and they have different needs. One of the main things I do at our middle school and high school is work with research projects. Um, a lot of times those are in our English classes, but sometimes science, social studies as well. We use a program called Noodle Tools um, for that to help them organize their research projects. I'll go in and kind of co-teach with the teachers, help students find reliable resources, um, some of which just kind of like generally online, some of which are through our AEA's databases. Um, and then they organize it with Noodle Tools so we can talk about you know, academic integrity and making sure they're giving credit to their sources, which um, honestly is not the student's most exciting thing that they do, but it's an important skill and I always remind them that they will be researching beyond school, you know, whether they go on to a college or whatever, they're still going to have to research when they want their next car, or their next cell phone or whatever. So those research skills are really important. 
Um, another thing that we have at the middle school and the high school are some of our bike desks, and those have been particularly popular at the middle school. We have our study halls that uh, happen in the library, and that gives students kind of a physical outlet as they are either reading or doing homework. Another thing I've done for reader engagement um, at the middle school and high school uh, is book talks. I go into reading classes and talk through especially some of our newer books with kids, give them ideas of what to read for independent reading. The high school, I've done something called bathroom book blurbs, and you can see one up there from last year. Um, but every so often, I feature some of our newest books, and I put them up in the bathroom stalls near the library. Um, and then you'll have kids come into the library and say, hey, there's this book in the, li or in the bathroom. Where is it? Um, and so that's been kind of an interesting way to reach out to our high school students. Um, this slide just shows some of our most popular books. Um, it was January to Octo the end of October of 2020, the most checked out books at each of the different libraries. Um, so you can see Page and Lincoln down at the bottom left, uh, Franklin bottom right, and then Boone High and Boone Middle School up at the top. Um, so that's important to, for me to track that, to know what kids are reading, what genres they are enjoying, um, so that I can build our collection. I do some other things with collection development too. Mitch, you wanna go to the next slide? So we, I get a budget every year in the fall and I have to kind of figure out what are our needs as far as books for our students. One of the main things I start with is the Iowa School Librarians list. Um, and so they come out with four different lists every year of kind of the best books rated by students, teachers, and librarians across the state. And so I use those kind of as basis. The kids also get to know those books. Um, and then I kind of build from there, reading reviews, looking to see what's popular, what students are asking for. Um, at the high school, I have QR codes where students can scan, and then it'll take them to a Google form where they can, rec or they can ask for certain books. Most of our younger kids will just go to the library associates and say, hey, can we get this, or whatever. And then I go through and I look at the reviews and decide what we should purchase for the library. What questions do you have for me? That's a lot of information, but kind of a, a quick overview of life in the Boone Library. I mean, there's definitely a drop off as we hit our older kids. Like if I look at the circulation numbers for the middle school versus the high school, it's much lower at the high school. Um, I think it's been really great that this year our English teachers have asked our students to do some independent reading in class and are blocking out class time to do that. Um, I've also been trying to make students aware of like ebooks and audiobooks through Mac and Bia, that's through our AEA, um, because sometimes I know those fit into the busier schedules when other ones don't. Um, it also kind of appeals to the podcast listeners, those ebooks or audiobooks, excuse me. How would someone go about? viewing what's in our library or seeing what books we have available. Is that publicly available? Yeah, it is. Um, so from the school website, there is, I think it's like departments, and then it says library media. And from our library media webpage, there's a catalog for all five of our schools and for the homeschool linked there. Have you had any questions from the community or parents about books in our libraries? Uh, you know, I really haven't. It's been on the news a lot lately, and Julie and Jill and I actually spoke about that not too long ago. It's been on the news a lot. I have not had a lot of concerns. The only concern I've ever had raised about a book was my first year in this position. It was a middle school book. It was a fifth grade parent um, who reached out to me and said, you know, I'm not sure if this is age appropriate. And, you know, I talked her through, like, here are what the reviews say, and we also have a fifth through eighth grade library, so not every book is going to fit with every student, and I was able to resolve it that way. Um, so I you know, kind of hope that that is, that people will come to me and ask questions if they have them, but there is a process if there are greater concerns. Any other questions? I just want to take some time to recognize Sydney because she has a monumental job. I think she does a phenomenal job given that she has five buildings and one member. But so, amazing associates to help me. <laughs> but I, I, again, you know, you can see, you know, the quality of instruction that our students are getting as a result of the work that she does. So I just want to make sure that I publicly recognize the work that she is doing.
Okay, on to district project overviews, which I'm guessing will be some exciting news and some slightly depressing news. <laughs> okay, so um, Mitch and I are going to present to all of you on the different projects that we have, kind of give you an overview of what our goals are for each of the projects, as well as our budget amounts and um, where bids have come in. So go ahead and slide to the next one. This is our table of contents for this evening. So you can see we have uh, just a few projects on our plate right now. You can see uh, the Early Childhood Center project, Futures in HSAP Building Project, High School Gym and Renovation, the HVAC Upgrade City Road Project, um, and the, any questions or comments that you have when we've been able to provide you with the information. So this is just a sketch of what our new elementary building may look like. That's what gets us really excited and, and energized, um, seeing that that um, is coming closer and closer to fruition. This is just another side view of if you're going to be picking up your students um, at the roadway coming in. So here are our project goals for our new elementary school. We want to continue the development of our district infrastructure. This has been part of a long-term plan. We want to uh, create uh, a safer and more secure learning environment for our students in one facility. We currently have two, and, and you're all well aware of the fact that they are not ADA compatible and, and have some um, other issues that we would like to improve upon. Uh, safer and improved community access and utilization. Uh, our current buildings are nestled in amongst um, city streets, so there's really no parking, and, and, and drop-off and pick-up can be quite exciting um, depending on the day. We want to just replace um, Lincoln and Page. Just it's time um, to do so. We want to contribute to the economic uh, development and growth in Boone and attract and retain student enrollment. So those are our goals in our having this new elementary facility. Here's a timeline of what we've um, gone through, starting with the passing of the bond. Um, we're very appreciative of our community's um, approval rating of 80.56 approval um, with our bond vote passing. Um, that was for $23 million. And we closed on the property um, on March 11th. We had a groundbreaking recently in October. Um, our bids were opened December 7th. And tonight we're hoping to award the contract bids with starting construction this spring and an anticipated opening of fall of 2023. Here's some of the more um, less exciting news. <laughs> so we're gonna start with our um, original budget and our bond language. So when we bonded, we purposely bonded trying to ensure that we had a little bit of wiggle room because pricing always changes over time. So um, at that time, um, the total price was going to be approximately $21.8 million. Um, again, we did have the bond issue for $23 million, um, giving us 1.1 um, leeway. And then we were going to contribute about 450000 of our PEARL funds for the uh, playground. So we anticipated at that time having 1.6 roughly million dollars um, of wiggle room should some of the pricing go up potentially. So as time went along, um, there are other projects that occur in the state that we watch closely and we were seeing that prices had increased dramatically. And so we rebudgeted um, when we saw some projects that were similar to the project that we have going with our elementary school. And at that time, it was looking to like our total price would be roughly 27 million. Um, we then decided to commit some food service um, dollars to helping um, fund the uh, nutrition portion of the new building. And you can see what our overage was prior to the bid opening. So we had already um, received some not so great news that the pricing was gonna be over. Um, and then our budget after the bidding, we're sitting at $5.2 million over. So our total price would be 29179294 when we originally planned on it being 21.8. 
and so you can see that our bond issue will accommodate 23 million of it. And then we did, again, add extra fee service money to try and help offset some of that overage. But that's kind of where we sit right now with our elementary financing. Mitch, do you want to add anything? I would just say we, uh, <coughs> a few months ago, we sat down and we um, did some cutting for that building and saved probably $1.6 million. So we already did some value engineering quite a few months ago. So. Thank you. We did do that. One point six, and and that's after we did the value engineering. So those numbers are after that. So this would be a picture of the future homeschool futures building, the outside of it. And this would be on the futures side as you enter the building. And this would be on the homeschool side when you enter the building. And then this middle part is. Um, the athletic facility that we've held several public hearings about. And this would be a space that would be uh, rented out to community members if they needed to rent our facilities. We anticipate utilizing it for pitching and batting practices. Um, right now you see it with the cement floor. That would be some of our value engineering. We wait on a wait on a floor a little bit um, budget wise, but this is roughly um, the size of half a gym. So if, if it's hard to see, how large that is, that's about half a gym size. So that would be located between the HSAP and Futures Building. And our goals with this um, project were, again, to continue the development of our infrastructure and, and have a safer and more secure learning environment for both programs. Um, but we also, as we all know, have a need for um, gym space, multi-purpose space for the district and the community, and we feel that this would be a way to help meet that need. And it also provides more stability for both programs um, long term. And then our timeline, um, we took board action on April 12th, and our bids were open November 23rd. Um, you see that our anticipated award contract bid is the 19th. Part of that is because when um, we went through the hearings and our bond language, our bond um, language had a number below what the bids came in at. So some of that will need to be redone. We'll need to have those hearings again and some of the board action taken again. So um, we need to delay that a bit and then uh, start construction in the spring and have an anticipated opening probably fall of 23, it says 22, but it should be 23. Um, and then we already own that land. I've been told the easiest way people know where this is is the weed patch. Even though I try to give addresses, everyone seems to know where that is. So. Um, so we do already own that land. It's a matter of um, being able to award the bids. And then this would be a sales tax bond. It is not property taxes. Um, it does have a pub public hearing process, as we've stated before, because of that gym space. We have um, a legal requirement to have more public hearings because of that, because it's considered an athletic facility and not um, act an actual school site. Oh, okay. And then um, our budget prior to bidding, um, we were anticipating 4.3 million, um, came in about 5.2 million. So therefore we need to redo some of those um, hearings and um, board actions. And this is a picture of the gym remodel. Notice the bulkhead um, that we currently have would um, be gone, would allow us to have a 94 foot court instead of 84 feet. Um, we would need have uh, new bleachers. Uh, our bleachers that we currently have were actually bought used um, when, the, when the gym was put into place and then the new floor and repainting. We would also have some ability to have some volleyball nets hanging and storage of uh, wrestling mats up in the ceiling as well. So a wide variety of opportunities in addition to the windows um, that you see we don't currently have natural light in the gym and this would also allow us to have some natural light coming into the gym as well 
these are our goals for our high school gym renovation to um, it is just an extension of the addition plan from the high school uh, remodel project that began in 2011. Um, the gym floor is at the end of its life and the bleachers truly are, they've been repaired about as much as they can possibly be repaired, especially when um, they were purchased used when the gym was built in 1986. Um, we wanna continue with that Torador pride that we already have in the building, just continue with um, the branding that we have. And again, a 94 foot court to align with our other conference schools. We are the only school district in our conference that does not currently have um, a 94 foot court. This is the timeline for our gym renovation. Um, board action to look at the projects in April. We open the bids in uh, November 23rd. We hope to award the contract bid this evening. Uh, start construction in the spring and have anticipated completion by the tar start of the school year in the fall. Again, this would be a project paid with sales tax bond um, and the HVAC project, um, you'll see overage. We haven't gotten to the HVAC project yet. Uh, not pro property tax, it is a sales tax bond. Um, the gym remodel came in the closest to our, our planned budget of all the projects. So um, our budgeting prior to was 1.86 and came in about 1.984. So our HVAC upgrade project goals are to complete air conditioning in the high school building. Any of you that have attended graduation know that there's no air conditioning currently in the gym. And it would also improve the air quality within the 1986 portion of the building, which also is a key component for us to being able to use ESSER funding to help with the project costs. ESSER funding is federal funding that's provided to uh, school districts to um, use for COVID related expenses. And so that is um, what we plan to use our ESSER funding for is the HVAC upgrade. We do, um, the timeline for this again, was April 12th, the board took action to look into the projects. Biz opened on the 23rd of November. We hope to award the contract um, this evening, start construction in the winter and uh, anticipated completion being the same as the gym with uh, fall of 2022. And with the budget, the thing to know about ESSER funding, we also have to have prior approval to receive ESSER funds and we have received that, uh, applied for and received approval for $2.5 million. Um, we do not have uh, 3.4 million of ESSER funds, so we have leveraged the amount of ESSER funds that we have to go towards the HVAC project. We plan to pay for the overage with the sales tax bond with the gym renovation project. Again, this is not, um, property taxes that we're talking about, it's sales tax bonding. And um, you can see that the HVAC project did come in over budget, but we plan to wrap that overage into our um, sales tax bond with the gym reno renovation. And ESSER funding also only has um, one-time funding. It's not something that we'll ever be able to attain again, and it does expire in 2023. Our city road um, project, city school road project uh, goals are that we want to ensure that there is a roadway connecting Hancock Drive and Corporal Roger Snedden Drive. Um, we wanna allow for quick access to Highway 30 and decrease traffic within the surrounding neighborhoods with the building of the new elementary school. So those were our goals for this city school road project. Um, our goal would be to um, continue to work as we have with the city on uh, the road plans, award bids and start construction in 2022 and with an anticipated completion of fall of 2023. So this last slide is a summary of our projects of where our preliminary budget was and where we are today in today's time and the amount that um, those bid totals came in over our original amounts. And um, so you can see where we sit. 
just a note to add. <coughs> when we were looking at the elementary two, we had to create that bond language in September, um, months before the election. So we had no idea where the market would be. We planned on that building being 235 a square foot, and it's at 299 a square foot. So we realized that we went way over, um, but that's just how the market changed. One thing real quick, <coughs> I get asked about these projects a lot and everybody wants to know why in the world are you doing so many projects at once? Right, I mean, it, it, it looks like a lot and it is. Unfortunately, we're in a position where we, we have to do some of these projects in an environment that's not conducive to, to construction. I mean, it's just, it's tough right now, but a lot of these are intertwined in ways that people don't fully realize. I mean, we build, getting rid of Lincoln means we have to get rid of our um, futures building. The lease out there in the strip mall for a homeschool building was never meant to be a long-term solution. It was a quick solution to a problem we were having with another lease in town. And so those two projects had to be looked at at the same time. Um, the ESSER funds, a lot of people don't understand, but that's our, our COVID money that we got that has to be used for COVID-related expenditures. HVAC in this building has been increasingly expensive to repair. Some of them are unrepairable and it's a very convenient way to use that money and it happens to tie in with the gym project which is necessary to keep us competitive in our conference. Doing those two projects at the same time mean the high school is only disrupted for one period of time instead of two periods of time. Um, you know, doing the gym remodel which seems like the only one that was close to budget is a good idea, but then having to come back and update the HVAC in a freshly remodeled gym is not a great idea when you couple that with how disruptive it would be to the building. Um, so it, it is a lot and it looks like a lot, but it has been well thought out. And one thing I'd like to point out is while it is a bad time to do these, we, we have to do them. And years and years of good financial stewardship by previous boards, Mitch and previous, um, um, business officials has made it so that we can weather this much better than a lot of districts. I mean, a lot of districts would not be able to handle this and we're in a spot where it'll be tough for us, but it'll be manageable if we do it the right way. And if we do it the right way, I think we'll look back and be proud of what we accomplished and, and the fact that we put our school forward in a responsible way, even in a tough environment, I think that's something we'll all be proud of. So I just wanted to make that clear that they are intertwined. It looks like a lot, but <coughs> it is well thought out and uh, we're gonna push forward and, and do it the right way. Anything from any other board members? Yeah, I'll just say I've been on the board for several years and the financial situation on the board right now is the best I've seen it. And when I go to state meetings, um, our district's finances are one of the ones held out as the shining example. So I think that we can weather this and you also just have to walk through the buildings that we're replacing. Um, the future building, um, that's over 100 years old. Uh, the Boone um, Homeschool Program building, we're having major maintenance problems out there. So that needs, to, and that was only a temp, supposed to be a temporary fix a few years ago. Anyway, we've already talked about Lincoln and Page for a few years now, and we're just hoping for one more or two more winners and um, on the furnace and no major leaks in the roof, and so we can get through there. So that's why all these had to be done. And then the uh, COVID money, uh, if we send it back to the federal government, that COVID money is not gonna come off our local property taxes. It's gonna go to some other school district to find something else to do. So I um, feel this is the best usage of that money to improve the circulation in um, the 86 building that we're in right now. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions? Julie, Mitch, anything to add? I'll just echo that uh, all of the decisions the district's made financially about refinancing or refunding has also helped contribute to this being possible and good stewardship of, of tax dollars and being fiscally responsible allows for this kind of action to take place. So um, while I've uh, only been here a year and a half all of the work that's come prior has also helped laid that foundation. So I just, 
want the community to appreciate the fact that those decisions do have long-term benefits um, when we're doing that refunding and refinancing, and you have heard this fall us continuing that um, as well because we have um, also started refinancing some more bonds so that we can continue to be fiscally responsible. So that's all I have to add. If there's nothing else, we'll move on to 3.06, which is consideration of construction bids for the Boone Early Childhood Center project. Uh, thank, thank you, board members. I'm Steve Lang, president of Lang Construction Group. We're the construction manager for the Early Childhood Center. Um, we, get, we have our letter of recommendation up on the board here, but we took bids last Tuesday, the 7th of December, on 11 bid packages for the Early Childhood Center. We received 29 bids across those 11 bid packages. And uh, we, we, we got pretty good coverage on some of them. A couple of them, there was only one bid, but that's just a reflection of what's going on in the market today. Our, our recommendation is to award to the low bidder in each category and also uh, after some discussion with uh, district staff and administration there are four alternates that that we are recommending that we that we have approve um, i'll run through these really quickly um, first one is bid package number two it's a grading and utilities uh, we uh, recommend awarding that to construct inc uh, their base bid was $1,345,000. There's also an alternate for the, some work there that was for utility work south of the property line uh, to make sure we've got drainage off of the Early Childhood Center site uh, for an add of $275,000. So that award would be for $1,620,000 to construct. Bid package number two is for all the concrete work on the project. Uh, we're recommending awarding that to Jensen Builders for the base bid amount of $2,614,000. Bid package number four is for the general construction portion of the project. We are recommending awarding that to Graphite Construction Group. Their base bid was $3,154,000. There's an alternate there that we are also recommending, and that is to add the bleachers in the gymnasium for a total of uh, $49,000, which uh, will give them a contract of $3,203,000. Bid package number five is the masonry work on the project. We're recommending awarding that to Seedorf Masonry for their base bid amount of $1,494,540. Bid package number six is the steel work on the project, recommending awarding that to Core Construction Services for their base bid amount of $3,332,000. Bid package number seven is the roofing on the project, recommending awarding that to Central States Roofing Company for their base bid amount of $731,700. Bid package number eight is the glass and glazing portion of the project, recommending awarding that to Boone Glass Company for their base bid amount of $795,380. Bid package number nine, drywall acoustical and painting. We're recommending award of that to Hilsebeck Schott their base bid amount was $2,139,900 plus an alternate to add acoustical panels in the gymnasium and the commons areas. Uh, the amount of that add alternate is $37,900. Total contract amount will be $2,177,800. Bid package number 10 is the mechanical construction recommending awarding that to Kruk Plumbing and Heating of Boone. Their base bid amount was $4,493,700. And 
There's also an, an alternate for this one for temperature controls. We actually took quotes on three different temperature control systems um, and decided on the one for Woodman controls to match what else is in the district. Uh, that ad amount was $270,000, making the recommended amount for Cruck $4,763,700. Uh, bid package number 11 is electrical construction, recommending awarding that to Enterprise Electric of Boone for the base bid amount of $1,952,000. And the last bid package is for kitchen equipment, uh, recommending award that to Plexus Company, which is doing business as Cullinex. Uh, their base bid amount is $687,865. So that is our recommendations. Any questions from anybody? Number three, it says uh, $50 for cubic yards, including contract cost. How many cubic yards are we talking about? I get nervous when I see that. Yeah, what, what we did there is we took some unit prices on some various things that, that, we, that may be unforeseen conditions. And, and the ones that you see there, there's also one on um, uh, bid package number two for $25 per lineal foot for some drain tile. If we get into some wet moisture or wet, wet ground along the pavement, we'll add some drain tile to that at a cost of $25 per lineal foot. We won't really understand that until we get into the construction and see what the dirt is like. Uh, same way for the $50 per cubic yard. When we dig the foundations and get ready to pour the concrete, we will run tests to make sure that the bottom of the footings have the right bearing pressure. If they don't, we have a unit price to modify that and make it so it will be. <coughs> uh, we also took some alternate pricing on some, some additional kitchen equipment um, that is, is there, so the unit price is on different items if we want to add those later on in the process. So we are not including any of those dollar amounts in the awards that we're recommending tonight. If that comes back, it will come back to the board as a change order <coughs> for the actual amount that, that they are for. Any other questions? If not, we'd entertain a motion to accept the bid packages and alt alternates as outlined by Steve. I'll move that we accept. I'll move that we accept the recommendations from Lane Construction Group as presented tonight to the board. Is there a second? Second. Last chance for any questions or comments? the letter sign off the page right after it, the letter sign off it's kind of a summary page that one okay so th all the bids came in and that's how much it's going to cost right Okay. The control value is that the amount that we're awarding tonight is the uh, 23317985 is what we're asking for the bid on tonight. Yeah. Okay. Pam, this yeah. is Mitch. It doesn't include the architect and CM fees and furniture, yeah. so. Yeah. When we talked about full package, that was everything. Oh, yeah. I understand. Okay. Any other questions? If none, we have a motion and a second, and uh, we'll do a roll call vote on this one, Mitch. Elfong? Yes. Nystrom? Yes. Melhouse? Yes. Teban? Yes. Pritchard? Yes. Motion carries, so we'll move on to 3.07. Consideration of construction bids for the high school gym renovation and high school HVAC projects. Thank you. 
Uh, well, uh, thank you for uh, having me tonight. I'm Chad West with Tenfold Architecture. And uh, Ms. Trepa gave a, a good summary of the two projects that we are recommending for approval tonight. The first one is the high school gymnasium upgrades project. Uh, we took bids on Tuesday, November 23rd, and um, got pretty good pricing, uh, all things considered with the bid market. So uh, we're recommending uh, award of contract to Edge Commercial out of Grimes uh, with base bid amount of 1660000 uh, and also recommending uh, alternate number one uh, for 137000 And as a reminder, alternate number one is to overlay the existing uh, metal roof on the gym uh, with uh, insulation and EPVM roofing. And then the uh, second recommendation is for the HVAC upgrades project. Uh, we recommend uh, approval and award to uh, Henkel Construction, uh, base bid amount of $2,725,000, um, and also recommending uh, acceptance of alternate number one, which is the second chiller for $380,300. And as Ms. Trepa mentioned, um, <coughs> there is no recommendation to proceed with the, uh, the Futures High School project at this point uh, because of the need to uh, redo the public hearing. Uh, those bids did come in higher than uh, originally uh, published and she spoke about at previous public hearings. So that's, uh, well, we'll, we'll wait on that, but hopefully can award that in, in January. Any questions on that? Hearing no questions, I'd entertain a motion to approve the bids as outlined. I'll move to approve both the high school gym upgrades and the gym and HVAC projects as one motion. It's been moved. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Mitch, call the roll, please. Yes. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. <coughs> okay, on to 3.08, um, New Boone Early Childhood Center Road Project update. Julie? Yes, as we've been collaborating with the city on the road connecting Hancock Drive and Corporal Rogers Snedden Drive, uh, I believe we've reached a point where it would be appropriate to take formal board action demonstrating this commitment, so we just need a motion stating such. I would move to pledge our commitment to completing the road connecting Hancock Drive to Corporal Roger Snedden Drive with a goal completion date of fall of 2023. A motion by M Matt. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, Mitch, I think we'll call the roll on this one too. Sorry, any further questions, discussion? Anything to add? Hearing none, Mitch, go ahead and call the roll. Alphon? Yes. Nystrom? Yes. Melhouse? Yes. Teban? Yes. Pritchard? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, 3.09 resolution fixing the date for a public hearing on the proposed use of saved revenue for an athletic facility infrastructure project. Uh, Julia, quick update on this. Yeah, this is just a resolution that will um, have our hearing date for the uh, save revenue for the athletic facility again. Same same thing that we've done before. We just need to review it. This is for the this is for the homeschool. This is project. for the homeschool futures. And what's the date of that public hearing? Is that set yet? Just a moment. We've got a lot of dates. January 3rd at 6.30. I move to fix the date for the public hearing on the proposed use of save revenue for an athletic facility infrastructure project for January 3rd at 6.30. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Mitch, call the roll, please. Oh, sorry, any further questions or discussion? 
If none, we'll call the roll. Roll call. Elfon? Yes. Nystrom? Yes. Melhouse? Yes. Teban? Yes. Pritchard? Yes. Okay, we'll keep going here. 3.10, Community Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention Program, MOU. So this is something that we've done previously. This is just for this year, a memorandum of understanding with YSS for our CAP program. And what fund does that come out of, Julie? I'm sorry? What, how do we, what fund does that program come out of? It's free. Oh, it is, okay. <laughs> Good. And just collaborating with them. I thought it was a title. That's any questions or comments from the board? I move to approve the MOU with Youth and Shelter Services. Is there a second? Second. Any further questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 3.11, out-of-state travel. So anytime our administrators um, wish to participate in professional development training outside the state, we come to you as a board to um, ask for approval, and this would be approval to allow for um, some of our administrators to attend the High Reliability School Summit in San Antonio, Texas. This will take place in February. Is there, this is already budgeted for, is that correct? Yes, this is part of our, nor our professional development dollars that we had planned to spend anyway. Any other questions? If not, I'd entertain a motion. I move to approve out-of-state training for administrators for the High Reliability School Summit in San Antonio, Texas in February. We have a motion, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any other questions or discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 312 ACT testing report. Uh, Dr. Jaynes will come and share with you um, our ACT assessment results from, I believe this is from last year. Now, now I'll be loud. Uh, I have two reports for you tonight. I have our graduating class of 2021 report as well as um, the results of our uh, ACT testing that we did with all of our juniors in um, spring. And so that's kind of a little preview. It, it gives us an idea of where this graduating class of 2022 may fall. So um, bear in mind that comparisons across years are a little bit hard because the um, typical high school education of kids for the last year and a half has not necessarily matched what it would have been in 16, 17. But um, this kind of tells you where our students landed um, with the statewide uh, average. Um, last year's data is just a black hole, so I apologize. I don't have that as a comparison in there, but um, across the state, typically 50 to 65 percent of a graduating class take the ACT. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of um, a comparison of numbers. And if you scroll down, um, you can see our average is typically a bit lower than the state average, but we also test 100% of our students because we have all the juniors take them. So we like to provide for you a kind of a breakdown of if we looked at just the top 25% of our scores um, taking that ACT, how many students would that be and what would their averages be? Um, and in, in uh, 2021, the percentage across the state of students taking the ACT was lower um, than typical. Usually the state sees 50 to, uh, or more like 60 some percent taking the ACT and they only had 47 percent um, of, of our Iowa graduating seniors taking that test. So um, there's definitely some COVID um, influences there on that data, but you can see that um, if we break it down by quartiles, our top 50 percent, our top 75 percent um, of students taking that exam um, as graduating seniors are pretty comparable with that state average. Okay, and in, so that's our graduating seniors. 
if you scroll then our juniors, um, we were able to, we, we did a lot of ACT last year. We had a group of that senior class actually took the ACT with us um, in October because they weren't able to take it in uh, March or April of uh, 2020. So they took that test in October and then we turned around in April and we gave, gave the district-wide ACT test again for all of our juniors. Um, so there's not a comparison date for 1920 because again, those we didn't do spring testing with that group, um, but you can kind of see how uh, this year's senior class uh, tested as juniors compared to how previous classes did. And again, just bear in mind that those previous classes wouldn't have had interruptions that uh, this class did. So those numbers do seem a little bit lower um, than some previous classes, particularly um, if I look, it seemed like we took a bigger hit in math than normal. So um, that kind of stood out to me. And then um, when we look across our uh, students that are meeting those uh, college and career readiness benchmarks, just gives us a little bit of an idea. Our English and reading scores um, typically are higher, they remained higher, and I think, again, we took a little bit more of a hit in math with our students that were meeting those benchmarks. Usually we have um, anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of our students that choose to take the ACT test again. Last year's group actually had less kids than, than uh, normal because they had just taken it in October of their senior year, so not nearly as many of them turned around and uh, took it again before graduation. But usually when we test in March or April, that's a nice experience for kids as juniors. But then after they finish those junior courses, and particularly as they take um, that fall semester of their uh, senior year, we have students that um, want to try again because they have more coursework under their belt as they take uh, maybe some calculus or some other math that helps them um, perhaps be more successful on that test. I will entertain any questions or comments. Are there certain districts that test all juniors or is that a di district level decision or a state decision? Why do we do that? Why do we do that? I was not in this position when this board voted for that. So I don't know if any of you were. I believe that happened about the time I came on the board and the board was looking for a way to try to compare all of our students and our programs to see if there were areas of weakness. And so that's why it was state we tested all of our kids and also to offer the opportunity for um, testing for some of our kids who might not necessarily normally do it and then all of a sudden they pull a score, they get an ACT of 25 and it might change their career path. They might have thought, I'm not smart enough to go to so-and-so university <coughs> or whatever. And so we, we've, we see one of those, two of those changes. So those were the reasons it was voted for. I think last I checked, uh, two or three years ago, there were like five or six districts that in the state that do do that, so. We are, we are definitely one of few that test all of our juniors, but I do think the, uh, my understanding of the reason we did it that first year in 13-14 was um, for some data for all of our kids and also just to kind of open doors and, and kind of set that out there that we expect all of our kids to have that opportunity to take that test and be, um, have that experience with whether they use it instantly and go on to college or not, um, have that under their belt. Julie, anything I would to add to that that you understand? I think it also, um, meets one of our goals as a board and as a district to ensure that all of our students will achieve at high levels so that you know by allowing them to take the ACT we're ensuring that we're preparing them well enough to be successful on that if that's the pathway they want to take and they want to utilize the ACT as a vehicle to go to college or not we have allowed them to have a pathway if they would so choose. Um, we don't want to close any doors for our kids, and I think sometimes um, historically the ACT has been a door that closes for some students because they um, maybe don't have the means to take the ACT or have a perception that they would not be successful. And by having all of our students take it, it also um, ensures that we're providing the kind of education that they need to be successful. So I would commend the board for being so forward thinking in the past to recognize the equity issues with that, as well as um, when we say we want all students to be successful, we mean it, and it's demonstrated through that action. As part of the um, our state dif um, differentiated accountability measures, uh, a new addition to that um, convoluted formula that uh, that uh, we look at to uh, determine if our schools are um, commendable, acceptable exceptional, whatever, um, a portion of that is calculated by the percentage of your students taking the ACT. So um, I believe 
maybe last year was the first year that that, last year or the year before was the first year that that was a data point that they include in that calculation. Um, but we beat a lot of people in state on that particular measure because we do offer that to all of our kids. So our participation rate is very high. Um, and then we just continue to look at how can we continue to um, support students in their overall scores on that measure. I'm glad we do it. It just seems like there's always issues with standardized testings and uh, comparing them year to year and them changing on a regular basis. Having everybody take the ACT would be a statewide comparison that would be beneficial for everybody. So I was just curious how that came about. had right before I left yeah and right before you know I left we talked about how when you give it to hundred percent of your students there's going to be a little different looking outcome but again everybody had an opportunity to take it it used to be kind of an exclusionary thing and you still maybe would get a 21 or a 22 average and so you know we knew and still felt that was a fairer thing to do. One thing I was going to comment on is in past years, we've kind of looked at the 50% um, mark when we take our top 50% students. And do you know what the state averages in each of these categories at the 50%? To compare the 50%, in other words, what was the state average for English score, math score? I know we got the overall composite is 21.5 and our top 50% is 22.9, which shows um, our top 50% is stands up very well. We typically receive a report that has that data. We really haven't gotten that report yet. So we have access to our scores and we have the, I have the overall state average that's been reported in the Des Moines Register and so on, but that breakdown from ACT, we haven't received it yet. Last year it came very late, uh, but this report's on here and it seems odd to report to ACT t twice, so we can definitely follow up when we receive that. But I also double checked with some other school districts to say, have you gotten your little file like that yet? Because I maybe we missed it, but um, that data hasn't come yet. But I wanted to be able to give you the graduating senior report at the same time, because it seems really delayed to report it in January or February for you. So. I don't have it in hand right now, but when we get it, we can certainly share that. Thanks, Jill. Don't go far, Jill. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Next one. Hold so, on. So 313, we need to set another public hearing for the, this one is for the 2022-23 20, school calendar. Yes, so um, our, we need to set the public hearing for the calendar and we would typically do that at the next regularly scheduled board meeting, which would be January 10th at 6.30. Um, what I wanted to comment on or some of the, just some of the feedback and I just wanted Jill to remain in case I forget something, um, but we have vetted this with a couple of different groups, um, some uh, ideas and ask for suggestions for the upcoming um, calendar and some of the comments um, that we have received that I wanted to make sure the community is aware of since we're setting this hearing for January and the board is aware of. Um, we've had a request to uh, explore it adding back in the uh, second early release that we had last year from um, COVID to provide more opportunities for our staff and their professional development. Um, they have definitely missed that this year and um, reinstating that is something that would be extremely beneficial to our staff, which in turn then becomes beneficial to our students. The other um, feedback that we received was that the uh, SIAC committee had felt strongly that we should end um, before Memorial Day. They did not want to go to school after Memorial Day, so they wondered if um, it was possible to make sure that we're adhering to the 1,080 hours but if um, not making up a snow day would allow us to get out before Memorial Day, that that be explored. That was something that was brought up and in response to that also maybe building in some more snow days. This year we built in one. Um, they're wondering if we build in more, maybe we could have a better opportunity to make those snow days up and not have to worry about just forgiving them. But that was um, some of the feedback that we received at the SIAC committee about the calendar. There, what else am I missing? I think that's the big one. They really explored different dates that 
or made suggestions on different dates that could be added in as um, a potential day off for some extended kind of long weekend times, but those would become built-in snow, snow days in, uh, I think we have one in April around uh, Easter this school year, and they suggested maybe doing a Friday, Monday, or uh, something like that in February, so there'd almost be like another little break in there. Um, but if you had snow days to make up, it could become make up snow days. Um, with the understanding that to do that with the parameters of the August 23rd start date and to be out before Memorial Day, that that would mean um, dropping down below that 179 or 180 days, but with that understanding that all those hours were there. And as we, we talked with them, it was um, pretty important to parents that kids were out before Memorial Day, um, at least from that committee. So we, we wanna explore that with that calendar hearing. I think the only other thing that was shared with us um, when they made the recommendation also about the extra early out is they just wanted to ensure that our BEEP program would um, provide care like they do for the first early out and that was something that we said we would communicate also that was and to make sure people were well aware in advance and we did speak to um, the hearing date and then um, our typical approval process so that we would be able to share out that information. So those are just some of the suggestions. So when we provide um, calendar options um, in January, we wanted you to know that those are items that we plan to implement into that calendar. I move to set the public hearing on the calendar for 6.30 p.m. on Monday, January 10th, 2022. We have a motion, is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Mitch, it looks like we need a roll call vote on this one. No. Nope. Oh, we're just setting the hearing, sorry. We're just setting it. So we're on to 314 January work session and special board meetings, Julie. Do we need to vote on that? Oh. Vote, vote. Okay, I apologize. <laughs> so we have a motion and a second to set the public hearing. All those in favor, aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Now we'll move on to 314, January work session, special board meeting. Okay, so we have on the agenda all of the dates and I'm gonna have Mitch chime in for what each date is again. If you recall when we talked about having to have some of the extra meetings um, to have the extra hearings, that that's what some of these dates are. So January 3rd at 630 in the high school library for the public hearing regarding our athletic facility, correct? And then January 19th, um, we need to decide on um, a time in the central office conference room for, for homeschool and futures building bids. And then um, January 24th at 5 p.m. in the high school library for We're selling our um, 3.1 million save bond and then one of our refunding bonds that day. So um, we have a first special meeting to approve those um, action items and then we um, flow into our regular board work session. And then we have a work session after that um, and we just need to um, decide on the agenda. I think we already had a work session scheduled and we and we just kept it, yeah. So we kept it. So I believe budget, what was the original work session? Yeah. Okay, so staffing, yeah. Yeah, so staffing would was the topic that we had originally, so I'd anticipate doing that. And this is why we have a board secretary to keep track of what we're doing for each of these meetings. So we need to decide on a time for the 19th, otherwise, um, we need to set those dates and times. So on the 19th, the options are 12 p.m. or 5.30. Mm -hmm. Honestly, y'all, on the 19th, I can do either one or I don't know. All these meetings are gonna take three of them, so. But the, the first two, uh, January 19th, please tell me to have someone to be there. Any other preferences on the noon versus five, 5.30? Five 
I'm good either way. On the 19th, I do have a commitment in the evening, so I would prefer we stuck to the 5.30 versus the 6.30, but. That's for the 19th, Matt. That's correct. Either one's fine with me. I prefer 5.30. Sounds like the consensus is 5.30 on the 19th then. I'll move that we have the special board meeting on January 3rd at 6.30 p.m. in the high school library. On January 19th, we will meet at 5.30 p.m. in the central office conference room. And then our third special board meeting will be January 24th at 5 p.m. in the high school library. Thanks for that motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second. Any other questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. 315, early graduation. On your board docs, you'll see we have students that are on track to meet the graduation requirements um, for early graduation, and we would recommend approval of these requests. Any questions? Otherwise, I'd entertain a motion. I move to approve these requests. Is there a second? Second. Second. There's a motion and a second on the floor. Any questions or comments? If none, all in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, on to superintendent's report, Julie. Uh, for my portion, I just want to invite our community to make themselves available on January 31st. We are hosting a portrait of a graduate event where we are um, wanting community input and conversation to determine what we think as a community our students need to be successful post-graduation. So that's taking place on January 31st. Uh, doors will open at 5, dinner will be provided. Um, the event will take from 5.30 to 7, and babysitting will be provided. So uh, our community members, our staff, and others will be uh, notified soon of this and have an opportunity to sign up ahead of time so we can make sure that we have enough food and supervision for babysitting services. But just wanted to put that on everyone's radar for January 31st and encourage you to come join us at the high school uh, in the high school commons to make that determination for what can help our students be successful. Anything for the good of the order? If nothing, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Meeting's adjourned. <laughs>